I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve. Thanks for watching today. We're in a series on Joshua called Rising to the Challenge. You know, Joshua took over from Moses when Moses died. Needless to say, he had big shoes to fill and big fears and obstacles to overcome. You and I can learn much from his faith, especially during these trying times as we deal with the coronavirus and the economic and social problems that it's caused. So grab your Bible and follow along as we learn from Joshua how to rise to the challenge. I'm told that English, for those who didn't grow up speaking it, is a very hard language to learn. It's hard because we have lots of rules, grammar rules, and it makes it difficult for people who are learning English as a second language to be able to uh, develop sentences and put things in the right order. It's hard, too, because in English we have lots of little idiomatic expressions and phrases. You know, those are, those are uh, expressions that we use. We know what they mean, but the, the meaning is different from the literal words. When we say it's raining cats and dogs, to a person who's not from here, who's learned the language, he doesn't know what you're talking about. We say, well, I, you must be pulling my leg. He says, no, I'm not. I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't do that to you. Uh, he doesn't know what that means. We talk about don't beat around the bush. They don't know what that means. There's another expression I like. It's the expression that we sometimes use about ourselves or we use about another person. It's an expression to express uh, disgrace. And the expression is this. The idiom is this. Your name is mud. Your name is mud. Now, I did a little research on that, that little idiom, and some said, well, it, was, uh, it, it had come into the language back in the early 1800s, but no doubt in 1865, it really took on steam as an idiom and as an expression. Now, in 1865, uh, we had the situation with... John Wilkes Booth assassinating Abraham Lincoln. As the story goes, when Booth shot him in the theater, when he was fleeing, he broke his leg, and he went to the home of a doctor who, uh, whom he knew, and that doctor treated him and helped him. The doctor said, I didn't know what the guy had done, but that doctor's name was Samuel Mudd. Samuel Mudd was arrested as a co-conspirator with John Wilkes Booth. He was tried, he was convicted, and sentenced to life in prison. Several years later, Andrew Johnson pardoned him and uh, let him go free, but they never took the crime off of his record. So that really gave fuel to the expression, your name is mud. We want to talk today in our ongoing series on the book of Joshua entitled Rising to the Challenge. We want to talk about a guy whose name meant mud. Actually, his name really meant trouble. His name was Achan. He's given time and space in Joshua chapter 7. The literal name of this guy is trouble. Achan means trouble or troubler. And so if you said, hey, here comes trouble, it was here comes Achan, because that's what his name meant. And so apropos, because he brought trouble into his life, into his family, and into the lives of the Israelites, because he did something so awful, so terrible, so horrible, his life serves as a warning to you and me of what happens when we blow off God's commands and we do things that we want to do. You know, God is a God who is holy, holy, holy. God is a God who hates sin. 
We forget that sometimes. We think that uh, we can kind of dabble in sin. We can play around with sin. We can have some hidden sin in our heart. No big deal. Uh, we can look at things we shouldn't look at. We can uh, participate in things we shouldn't participate in. We can have uh, this vice, that vice, the other vice. And uh, it's a clear violation of God's word. And we say, oh, well, as one girl told me once in, in uh, college, well, I just think that God understands that we have a weakness and we just sin in this area. She was talking about sexual immorality. God doesn't understand. God hates sin. He brings judgment upon sin. And so Achan and his story really serve as a warning to you and me that we need to fear God and we need to steer clear of sin and look at sin as if it were a rattlesnake in the coil. You don't get close to it because it will bite you and it will bring judgment from God. Let's look at the life of Achan, trouble with a capital T. Now, to understand Achan, you have to understand what we talked about last week, Jericho. So God sent the people into Jericho, and the thing, that was, that was the first battle when they came into the promised land. They come across the Jordan, a miracle. God parts the Jordan River. They come across, and then they go to a place called Gilgal, and it's there they set up the stones of remembrance of what God did to bring us into the land of promise. It's there that they circumcise the men. It's there that they have the Lord's Supper, that they eat of the land, that the manna ceases, and then they go and fight the battle of Jericho, and God gives them Jericho in a great miraculous victory. God won the victory. But now the Lord said this about Jericho in chapter 6 and verse 18. He said, uh, verse 17, and he says, and the city, Jericho, shall be under the ban. That means it's off limits to you. It and all that is in it belongs to the Lord. Only Rahab the harlot and all who are with her in the house shall live because she hid the messengers whom we sent. But as for you, this is Joshua uh, getting word from the Lord, giving it to the people. As for you, keep yourselves from the things under the ban, lest you covet them and take some of the things under the ban so you would make the camp of Israel a curse and bring trouble on it. But all the silver and gold and articles of bronze and iron are holy to the Lord. They shall go into the treasury of the Lord. God's not min mincing words. It's not hard to understand. Everything in Jericho belongs to God. And God says, burn it all with fire except the gold, except the silver, except the iron, except the bronze. You bring that in to the treasury of the Lord. Everything else is under the ban. Don't come near it. Don't covet it and don't take it. So they have the great victory. And we read at the end of chapter 6, it's just awesome. Nobody reads rebuild Jericho, God said. And it says, so the Lord was with Joshua and his fame was in all the land. I mean, it ends on an exclamation point. Everything is good. And chapter 7 starts with this word, but... But, that's like Scooby-Doo saying, rut row. Uh, but, there's a but in there, there's a rut row in there. It says, but the sons of Israel acted unfaithfully in regard to the things under the ban. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah from the tribe of Judah took some of the things under the ban. Therefore, the anger of the Lord, Lord burned against the sons of Israel. Serious, serious sin, and we're going to find out more about what he did. It says in verse 2, Now Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is near Beth Avon, east of Bethel, and said to them, Go up and spy out the land. So the men went up and spied out Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said to him, ah, Don't let all the people go up. Only about two or 3,000 men need to go up to Ai. I mean, it's just a small place, only two letters, Ai. Do not make all the people's toil up there, for they are few. So about 3,000 men from the people went up there, but they fled from the men of Ai. And the men of Ai struck down about 36 of their men and pursued them from the gate as far as Shebarim and struck them down on the descent so the hearts of the people melted and became as water. Then Joshua tore his clothes and fell to the earth on his face before the ark of the Lord until the evening, both he and the elders of Israel, and they put dust on their heads. They're in great distress. And Joshua prayed, and he said this, Alas, O Lord God, why did you ever bring this people over the Jordan only to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? 
If only we'd been willing to dwell beyond the Jordan. We should have just stayed in Moab on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, Lord, what can I say since Israel has turned their back before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land will hear of it, and they will surround us and cut off our name from the earth. And what will you do for your great name? So the Lord said to Joshua, rise up. Why is it that you've fallen on your face? Israel has sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, and they have even taken some of the things under the ban and have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. They took my stuff and put it among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst. Rise up, consecrate the people, and say, Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow. For thus the Lord, the God of Israel, has said, There are things under the ban in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you have removed the things under the ban from your midst. In the morning, then, you shall come near by your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes by lot shall come near by families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come near by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come near man by man. And it shall be that the one who is taken with the things under the ban shall be burned with fire, he and all that belongs to him, because he has transgressed the covenant of the Lord and because he has committed a disgraceful thing in Israel. Serious, serious consequences to the sin of Achan. I want you to notice with me three warnings from Joshua chapter 7. See, because we want to not follow in the footsteps of Achan. Uh, how, how can you avoid bringing trouble into your life and into your family and into the church and into the, the community of the saints? How can you avoid that? Three warnings. Warning number one, beware the sin of coveting. The sin of coveting. God said in Joshua chapter 6, be careful with that stuff. It's all under the ban. Don't covet it. Don't uh, go after it. To covet means to lust for, to long for, to desire, to take pleasure in things that God says no to. That's coveting. You know, that's the number 10 commandment on God's top 10. You shall not covet. You shall not lust for, long for, desire what? Your neighbor's house, your neighbor's spouse, anything that belongs to your neighbor, your neighbor's stuff. Don't covet that. Don't go after that. Jesus said in Luke 12, 15, beware and be on guard against every form of greed, every form of covetousness, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. So when Achan is chosen, Joshua says this to him in verse 19. Then Joshua said to Achan, My son, I implore you, give glory to the Lord, the God of Israel, and give praise to him, and tell me now what you have done. Do not hide it from me. So Achan answered Joshua and said, Truly I have sinned against the Lord, the God of Israel, and this is what I did. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar, a beautiful coat from Shinar, it was like an uh, Armani suit, he said, I wanted it. And 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight. Then I coveted them and took them. That's what he did. He coveted and he took them. Beware of the sin of coveting. Coveting is a very common sin. It's really, when you think about it, it's, it's a sin that's, that's uh, included in every other sin. As Achan said, I saw and I coveted. I saw and I coveted. Very common sin. It reminds us of what Eve, the Scripture says concerning Eve in Genesis chapter 3. When the devil was working on her to deceive her, it says, and when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes and desirable to make one wise, she took of the tree and ate and gave to her husband with her, and he ate. What did she do? She saw it. She fixated on that which was forbidden. That's exactly what Achan did. 
That's what David did, King David, in 2 Samuel chapter 11, when he's walking on the roof of his palace at evening time. And what does he do? He sees a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. He sees her, he wants her, the look turned to longing, the longing turned to lusting, the lusting turned to laying as he lay with her and committed adultery. Covetousness and coveting, it's, it's a very common sin and it's a very serious sin. It's a serious sin because it brings destruction. It brings about death. See, coveting happens in the heart. I read something from Erwin Lutzer, and I've never forgotten it. He said, the eye sees what the heart desires. The eye sees what the heart desires. Coveting is a problem in the heart. It's a problem that says, I'm, I'm wanting these things that God has said no to. I need to have these things that God said no to. That's why it says, do not cover your neighbor's house, your neighbor's spouse, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Because that's his stuff. That's not your stuff. You be happy and content with what God has given you, with your spouse, with your house, with your stuff. But beware and be on guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Coveting, a serious sin. It's a serious sin that brings forth death. Look what it says in James. But each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust is conceived, it gives birth to sin, and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Hey, let me ask you a question. Are you finding your satisfaction in the Lord, or is your heart being led astray to the things of this world? The Bible says, do not love the world, nor the things in the world. For if any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world, and the world is passing away, and also its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. Now, when we find ourselves not finding our satisfaction in Jesus, then we're susceptible to looking and seeing what our neighbor has, to see uh, what's over the fence, what's, what's over here. Maybe I could get involved in this. Maybe I could get involved in that. Whenever you sense your heart is starting to uh, love the things of this world, it says the love of the Father is not in you. It's kind of like your oil light that will come on in your car if you're low on oil. When the oil light comes on, that's an indicator light. That's, that's saying, hey, you got a big problem here. You're low on oil. You better pull over and get some oil in there or you're going to ha have a, a devastating consequence with your car. Loving the world is the oil light that comes on that says, hey, time out, uh, danger, danger, Will Robinson. You got trouble here because the love of the Father is not in you. You're not getting your satisfaction in the Lord. And in James, those verses we read in James, when it says, and each one is tempted when he's carried away and enticed by his own lust. That word entice means uh, like a fisherman baiting a hook. And see, the devil will bait the hook and throw it out there, and he'll try and get you to bite. He'll try and get you to focus in on that bait and then to bite on that bait. That's what Achan did. He coveted. He said, oh, man, look at that. Look at that Babylonian coat. Man, that would look so good on me. Oh, let me just try it on. I could try it on. That's, there's no problem with trying it on. I'll try it on. Oh, it fits perfect. I mean... This must be a blessing from God. It's a 42 regular, and it just fits so well. <laughs> Not a blessing from God. It's temptation from the enemy. And then he sees the silver. He sees the gold. And he says, you know, Jericho's filled with all sorts of things, and surely God's not going to mind if I take these things. He coveted. The eye sees what the heart desires. The Bible says, Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23, watch over your heart, guard your heart with all diligence, for from it flow the issues of life. Beware the sin of coveting. Second warning, 
Beware the sin of covering. There's the sin of coveting. Israel has both, God says, coveted and deceived. Beware the sin of covering. Look at verse 21 again. When I saw among the spoil a beautiful mantle from Shinar, that Shinar is Babylon, and 200 shekels of silver and a bar of gold, 50 shekels in weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are concealed in the earth inside my tent with the silver underneath it. He, he took that stuff when they were going in to, to eradicate and, and uh, exterminate all the inhabitants of Jericho. He took that stuff. And he took it back to his tent. And the Bible seems to indicate that his wife knew about it and his children knew about it because they're going to pay the price too. They were co-conspirators in this lie. And he took it into his tent and he dug under his tent, probably under a rug or something. He dug and he hid the Babylonian coat and he hid the gold and he hid the silver. He covered it over. And he says, no one saw what I did. But God saw. God saw. Because God sees everything we try to hide. He sees it all. The eyes of the Lord are in every place, Proverbs 15, 3 says, watching the evil and the good. There's no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are open and laid bare to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. God sees it all. God hears it all. God, everything you say, everything you do, everything you think, Everything you desire, everything in your heart, God sees that all. He hears all of that. You know, man, God doesn't see as man sees. Man sees the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. And he knows today what's in your heart. He knows if there's bitterness there. He knows if there's lust there. He knows if there's uh, jealousy there. He knows if there's so much anger and, and hatred toward another person. He knows that that's there. God sees it all. You can't hide that from God. I love the story of Moses. You know, Moses had uh, kind of a, a stumble at the gate when he started out his adult life. He was trying to help the Hebrews, and it says that he saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew. This is when he was prince in Egypt, you know, because he was raised by Pharaoh's daughter. He saw an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, and so he wanted to pay that person back and so when no one was around, he attacked that Egyptian. And the scripture says he looked this way and he looked that way. He looked to the left and he looked to the right. And when he saw no one was around, he killed the Egyptian and buried him in the sand. He looked to the left, he looked to the right, but he didn't look up. He didn't look up. And God saw what he did because God sees everything that you do and everything that I do, and his eyes are in every place. So God sees everything we try to hide, and God will not bless hidden sin. Why is this so important? Because if you want God to bless your life, he's not going to bless your life if you have hidden sin in your heart. Uh, the Scripture says in the book of Psalms, if I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear me. My prayers won't get answered. My life won't get blessed. No good things does he withhold from those who walk uprightly. But if you don't walk uprightly, he's going to withhold all kinds of good things because he can't bless you if you're in the darkness and not walking in the light. God will not bless hidden sin. Look what it says in verse 11. When jo you know, Joshua is kind of freaking out here because this is the one and only defeat that they have in the promised land. Joshua's a book of conquest. They're taking the land. God is saying, go get it. And Joshua's the general. Yeah, we're going to go get it. And they have this great victory at Jericho, but then they hit Ai, this place that's small, and they get whipped. And Joshua can't figure it out. God, why did you bring us here? If we're going to get whipped like this, and then you brought us into the promised land, you're just going to kill us. We should have stayed on the other side of the Jordan. We just should have stayed in, in Moab. And he's whining, he's griping. Now what are you going to do for your great name, Lord? And the Lord says, get up. Get up. Why have you fallen on your face? The problem is not with me, Joshua. The problem is with you and your people. Israel has sinned, verse 11. 
And they have also transgressed my covenant, which I commanded them, and they have even taken some of the things under the ban and have have both stolen and deceived. Moreover, they have also put them among their own things. Therefore, the sons of Israel cannot stand before their enemies. They turn their backs before their enemies, for they have become accursed. I will not be with you anymore unless you destroy the things under the ban from your midst." Well, good night. That's serious, serious consequences. I'm not going to be with you anymore. Well, the only way that they're able to do anything is because God is with them. You know, Jesus said in the New Testament, John chapter 15, I am the vine, you are the branches, you abide in me. Apart from me, you can do nothing. Nothing. I mean, you can go out and do things in the flesh. You can't do anything that's going to matter on eternity's clock. We have to be connected to the Lord. We need His presence. We need His power because we're not able in and of ourselves. And God says, I'm not going to bless you if you don't walk with me, if you don't deal with this sin. Well, He says in verse 11, Israel has sinned. But we know it's just one guy, Achan. Achan has sinned. Lord, it's not Israel. It's Achan that has sinned. But see, Achan was part of the, of the body called Israel. And when we're part of the body in the New Testament called the body of Christ, and when one person sins, the whole body suffers. You hit your finger with a hammer, and you say, well, you know, I mean, this hand feels okay. I mean, your whole body hurts if you hit your thumb with a hammer. And it's not just, you can't just isolate and say, well, you hurt over here. I mean, it just radiates through your whole body. Achan sinned, it affects Israel. 36 guys who went up to fight Ai died. Why? Because the Lord was not with them. Why wasn't the Lord with them? Because Achan had sinned. You know, when we come together as part of the church at FBC Texarkana, we talked about this in the membership class, it's really important how you live as a member of this church. It's important how you live as a a Christian. But when you attach yourself to a church, then you become a representative of that church. You're a representative of Christ. You're a representative of the body of Christ here at First Baptist Texarkana. And people will watch how you live. They'll watch what you do in the community. And especially in our community that is relatively small. You know, if you live in Dallas or you live in Houston or you live in some other big city, you can go about your business and not ever really see anybody from church. Uh, Lots of people that you know, they may not know a whole lot about you. But here, people will know who you are because the town is uh, relatively small enough for people to know. And they know if you are a member of the church. They know if you are a representative of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you talk like a sailor, if you are a cheapskate when you go out to eat, you always, uh, you know, give the the very least that you can give. If you're rude to your wife, if you're a mean, crabby neighbor to your neighbors, if you're dishonest in business, that reflects on the whole church. You know, we're called to, as we say often at our church, we're called to shine and share, to shine for Christ and share the good news of the gospel, share his story, share our story of how we came to know Christ. But if there's no shine, the sharing is hollow, the sharing is hypocritical. Why? Because, hey, you talk a big game, but you don't live it out. It's important to walk with God. The Bible says this. 1 John chapter 1 says this, this is the message we have heard from him and announced to you, that God is light, and in him there is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. Hey, let me ask you a question in the privacy of your own heart. Are you walking in the light, or are you just saying you're walking in the light? And you know that you're walking in the darkness. You know there's some uh, sin there that you haven't confessed, that you haven't dealt with. Achan knew what he had done. His wife, his kids knew what he had done. But they, as the Lord said, Israel has both stolen and deceived. What's the deception? I hid it in my tent, and I'm pretending like everything is okay. And it's not. You know, David did that same thing. 
when he sinned with Bathsheba. You know, he, he tries to cover everything up and cover everything over. And you read 2 Samuel chapter 11, and you'll find that nothing is mentioned about God until the last verse, and it says this, but the thing that David did was evil in the sight of the Lord because the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. Hey, God will not bless hidden sin. You got to get sin out of the shadows and into the light and under his blood. And God will uncover hidden sin. If you have hidden sin in your life, things that you're not dealing with, things that you're not being honest about, God's going to put the screws to you if you really are a child of God. That's what he did to David. That's why David said in Psalm 32, when I kept silent about my sin, my body wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night, your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was drained away as with the fever heat of summer. Selah, which means pause, feel this. God's hand is on me. God is squeezing the life out of me until I'm going to say, I have sin. God will uncover it. It says in Numbers chapter 32, Moses said this, be sure your sin will find you out. Be sure your sin will find you out. We don't sin in a vacuum. One man sinned. It affected his family. It affected the whole camp of Israel. God sees. God knows. You know you have to deal with it. I heard a story about a guy, he was in an apartment, about 25 years old, invited his mother over to have dinner. And his mother came over. She lived on the other side of town. She came over for dinner, and she noticed immediately that there was another person living in the apartment. So her son John was living with Julie. And the mother was like, what's up with this, John? He said, oh, mother, it's not like that. Get your mind out of the gutter. We're just roommates. I needed somebody to help me pay rent. She has her room. I have my room. It's, it's, there's nothing going on that would be uh, like that. The mother was skeptical. They had dinner. The mother's watching how they interact. Well, about a week later, Julie says to John, she says, hey, John, I'm looking for that nice silver gravy ladle that we have. And I know we had it last week when uh, your mother was here, but ever since your mother left, I can't find the gravy ladle. Uh, do you think your mother might have taken it? He said, well, I can't understand. I would be shocked that my mother would take something like that from us, but I'll ask her. So he sends her an email. He said, dear mom, he said, I'm not saying you took the gravy ladle, and I'm not saying you didn't take the gravy ladle, but the facts are this. The gravy ladle has been missing ever since you left our apartment. Love, John. Mother sends back an email. Dear John, I'm not saying you're sleeping with Julie, and I'm not saying you're not sleeping with Julie, but the facts are this. If Julie were sleeping in her own bed, she would have found the gravy ladle by now. Be sure your sin will find you out. Now, the Bible says this, Proverbs 28, verse 13. He who conceals his transgression, like Achan did, he who conceals his transgression will not prosper. But he who confesses and forsakes them will find compassion. Here's the way God works. If you conceal your sin, you try and cover up your sin, God will uncover it and expose you. But if you uncover your sin, you bring it before the Lord, you come before him with a broken, repentant heart, you uncover it, you say, Lord, this is what I did, and this was horrible and awful. Oh, God, please forgive me. Then he covers it in his blood. You try and cover it, he'll uncover it, but you uncover it, and he covers it in his blood. Hey, beware the sin of Coveting. Beware the sin of covering. I, I remember a pastor some years ago in, Dal in the Dallas area, large church, 
he had trouble with women and with adultery and immorality, and it, some things started to come out, and when they would confront him on his sin, he would admit to nothing unless they had proof. He would not ever say, well, I did this. He would just say, well, how do you know that I did that? Where is your proof that I did that? And he would admit, did not confess, he would just admit when they brought him the evidence. I had another friend of mine who got caught up, pastor got caught up in sexual immorality. He was so broken over his sin. He confessed his sin to some other pastors. He confessed his sin to his wife. He lost his church over his sin. And his wife knew and the church knew about one woman, but there were more than one. And so the person that was counseling him said this, when you get right with God, you need to sweep the corners. You need to sweep the corners of your life. You can't just uh, confess the, what people know because you know that there's other things in there. And so as hard as it was, he confessed to his wife. He swept the corners. He said there were more. She was devastated. But she was able to go on with him. He said it was about two weeks or three weeks later after he swept the corners, after he told his wife what had happened, that his wife got a letter in the mail from the other woman. And she said, you don't know this, but there are more. I'm not the only one, there are more. And she told her husband, she showed him the letter, and she said, if you hadn't told me about this, I wouldn't be able to go on with you. She said, as much as it hurt for you to tell me, thank you for telling me the truth. I tell people that in counseling all the time. Hey, unless you start being honest, you got nothing. You, you can't rebuild on a, a cracked slab. You have to be honest. You have to get things out in the open. You get it out of the shadows and under his blood and let God do a miracle. Hey, beware the sin of coveting. Beware the sin of covering. And lastly, beware the sin of squandering. The sin of squandering, the sin of not taking advantage of the opportunity that you have to get things right with God. Now, it's very interesting, as we read, how God told Joshua to go about finding who has sinned. Look at it again. Verse 14, uh, starting in verse 13. Rise up, consecrate the people, and say... Consecrate yourselves for tomorrow, for thus the Lord, the God of Israel, has said, there are things under the ban in your midst, O Israel. You cannot stand before your enemies until you have removed the things under the ban from your midst. In the morning, here's the program, in the morning, then you shall come near by your tribes. Remember the 12 tribes of Israel. You shall come near by your tribes, and it shall be that the tribe which the Lord takes by lot shall come near by families, and the family which the Lord takes shall come near by households, and the household which the Lord takes shall come near man by man. So God's going to weed it out. First the tribe, and then the, the family, and then the household, and then the man. All that takes time. It takes time to gather everybody. It takes time to cast lots to see where the lot falls. Why did God do it like that? Because God was giving Achan an opportunity to get right. He was giving him an opportunity to repent, and Achan squandered it. He was guilty of the sin of coveting. He was guilty of the sin of covering. He was guilty of the sin of squandering. Hey, God is gracious to give us an opportunity to repent. It says in the book of Revelation, chapter 2, to the church at Thyatira, it talks about the, the woman Jezebel who commits acts of immorality. The Lord says, I gave her time to repent, and she does not want to repent of the immorality in her life. I gave her time, but she doesn't want to repent. In the book of Genesis chapter 6, when God is getting ready to rain down a flood upon Noah's generation and upon that whole antediluvian uh, world, the Bible says, the Lord says, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, yet his days shall be 120 years. I'm giving them 120 years, God says, to get right. I'm giving them time to repent. 
But as we know from the story of Genesis, none of them repented other than Noah, Mrs. Noah, Ham, Shem, Japheth, and their three wives. That was just eight people that responded to God. God is gracious. He gives us opportunity and a time to repent. You know, God wants to forgive sin. God doesn't want to judge. He wants to forgive. He's a Savior. He's a forgiving Savior. The Lord, the Lord God, compassionate and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in loving kindness and truth, who keeps loving kindness for thousands, who forgives iniquity, transgression, and sin, yet he will by no means leave the guilty unpunished, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children and on the grandchildren to the third and fourth generations. God wants to forgive. And and the Scripture makes it clear. If you, Lord, Psalm 130, should mark iniquity, O Lord, who could stand? But there's forgiveness with you that you may be feared. You say, well, Jeff, but it sounds like Achan did confess. Achan was cornered like a rat. Achan had nowhere else to go. They chose his tribe. They chose his uh, family. They chose his uh, father's house. They chose, bam, 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 to him. And all the time, what's he thinking? You think in the mind of Achan. What's he thinking? Man, it just keeps getting closer and closer. What am I supposed to do? You're supposed to say, stop. It's me. I have sinned. God, have mercy. That's what he's supposed to do, but he didn't. He waited and waited and waited till the lot fell to him. You're the man, Achan. Give glory to God. Tell me what you did. Truly, I have sinned, he said. Not a confession of sin, not repentance from sin, but an admission of sin. That's like going 100 down I-30, and you get pulled over, and the guy says, you know how fast you were going? And you're like, well, I'm not really sure. You were going 100. Well, okay, I was going 100. You got me. Are you sorry you did it? No, I'm sorry I got caught. There's a big difference. Achan is not necessarily sorry he did it. He's sorry he got caught because he thought he could pull one over on God. He forgot that the eyes of the Lord are in every place watching the evil and the good. God is gracious to give us an opportunity to repent, and God is faithful to judge sin. Look what happened. So he says what he did. He says where the articles are, the the coat and the silver and the gold. Verse 22, so Joshua sent messengers, and they ran to the tent, and behold, it was concealed in his tent with the silver underneath it. And they took them from inside the tent and brought them to Joshua and to all the sons of Israel, and they poured them out before the Lord. How embarrassing, how shameful, how disgraceful. Those are God's things. You stole from God. They poured them out before the Lord. And it says, then Joshua and all Israel with him took Achan, the son of Zerah, the silver, the mantle, the bar of gold, his sons, his daughters, his oxen, his donkeys, his sheep, his tent, and all that belonged to him, and they brought him up to the valley of Achor. Achor and Achan are from the same root. That means trouble. And Joshua said, why have you troubled us? The Lord will trouble you this day. And all Israel stoned them with stones, and they burned them with fire after they had stoned them with stones. And they raised over him a great heap of stones that stands to this day. And the Lord turned from the fierceness of his anger. Therefore, the name of that place has been called the Valley of Achor to this day. God will judge sin. God hates sin. And as much as he wants to forgive, as much as he wants to cleanse, as much as he wants to save, if you say no, then judgment's going to fall. And it's going to fall severely. The Scripture says, Isaiah chapter 1, verse 18, Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. Truly, the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Achan was wiped out. His children were wiped out. You say, well, that just sounds so severe for what he did. It sounds severe to us. You know why? Here's the thing. We have lost the fear of God. Even in the church, we don't fear God. And we do things, and we play around with sin. Why? Because we don't fear God. Proverbs chapter 8, the fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride and arrogance and the evil way and the perverted mouth. I hate. 
But we don't hate that. Why? Because in our hearts, we're starting to love the world and the things of the world. If any man loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And we drift away, as it says in Revelation chapter 2 about the church in Ephesus. I have this against you. What is against, uh, what have we done, Lord? You have left your first love. You have drifted away from your first love. You used to love me supremely, but now you love other things. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the boastful pride of life. You're starting to love the world. And so we see this and we say, well, God can't do that. That's wrong for God to do. God is God. He's the judge of all the earth. Shall not the judge of all the earth deal justly? And remember this too about God. He's setting an example. He's done that in Scripture as we look through the the whole uh, counsel of God. He does that when he sets things up because he wants the people to fear him. So when he set up the priestly order with Aaron and his sons and the Ark of the Covenant and the tabernacle. What does it say? Leviticus chapter 10. Nadab and Abihu, sons of Aaron, they burned strange fire before the Lord, and fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them. You don't do that, burn strange fire before me. You do it the way I said to do it. We read about the people of Beth Shemesh in 1 Samuel chapter 6. You know, the Philistines had taken the Ark of the Covenant and they had brought it to the house of their god, Dagon. And, uh, man, they had all sorts of trouble with the Ark of the Covenant, so they wanted to get rid of it. They brought it back to Israel. And when the people of Beth Shemesh, when it came back on uh, some cows, they looked in there to make sure that everything was still in there that was supposed to be in there, and God killed many of them. And the people responded and they said, Who can stand before the Lord, this holy God? And God was emphasizing to the people, I am holy, holy, holy. You fear me. Not to be afraid of God, like I can't get near God, but God is to be feared. In the New Testament, when you have Ananias and Sapphira, Acts chapter 5, they lie in church. What happened to them? They died. God is saying, you don't do that. I'm going to do this as an example. Now, we take advantage of the fact that God is so merciful, he's so kind, he's so gracious, and we think, well, that is the norm. That's the way God should always be. No, don't presume upon God's mercy and God's grace and God's kindness and and God's compassion. He is those things, but you don't presume upon those things. If you presume upon those things, you lose sight of the holiness of God. The Bible says in Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11, because the sentence against an evil deed is not executed quickly, the hearts of the sons of men among them are given fully to do evil. Well, the sentence against this evil deed came swiftly. And what does that produce? Fear. Fear. Who can stand before the Lord, this holy God? And that's a healthy fear. When they set up the stones in Gilgal to commemorate crossing the Jordan. The Lord says at the end of chapter 4, Joshua chapter 4, he said, so that you would fear me forever, forever. I've told you before that the fear of the Lord, and understood in the correct way, is kind of like the fear of electricity. I mean, electricity is in this room. Nobody's scared about it. But we know that when you mess with electricity, you have to be very careful. Why? Because it can fry you. That's why. I was working in the chemical business years ago in the 90s, and one of my accounts, downtown building, had three-phase 480 power coming into the building, and two electricians had gotten careless, and they were electrocuted and they got fried by the electrical power. That's 480 volts. You know the most voltage, I looked this up, the most voltage ever produced was at a lab, and it was 25.5 million volts of electricity. What is God in terms of electricity? He's like 25 billion volts of electricity. What does the Bible say about God? He's a consuming fire. This world belongs to God. He created it. He set it up. And we, 
as a society worldwide have spit in his face and we said, forget you, God, we're going to go our own way. Hey, there's coming a day when the Lord is going to come back and he is going to deal out retribution to those who do not know God, to those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's a consuming fire. And we need to fear him, not in a way that we run from him because we're afraid. We need to give him honor. We need to give him glory. We need to give him respect because he's God. It's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. A terrifying thing. Listen, this convicted my own heart because I'm just like you in terms of uh, the frog in the water. You know, the temperature keeps going up and we keep getting more uh, compromise and more compromise and we just don't notice it. And it's like, well, that's just the way it is. And, and, you know, everybody's doing it, doing it, doing it. And we think, oh, this is okay. It's not okay. It's not okay. God hates sin. And if you don't deal with the sin in your life, God is going to uncover it. He is going to expose you. He's going to shame you. But if you will come now, as the Scripture says, come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you will consent and obey, you'll eat the best of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. Truly, the word of the Lord has been spoken. Do you want to rise to the challenge? It starts by giving your heart and life to Jesus Christ. Maybe you're watching and you know about Jesus, but you don't really know him. Today's the day for you. Pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe that you are God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, I ask you to come into my life, to forgive me of my sins, to be my Lord and my Savior, and I surrender all to you. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is using this broadcast to make a difference in your life, to know that you just prayed that prayer to receive Christ as Savior and Lord. Please take the time to call that toll-free number, write me, email me, let me know what's going on and how we can pray for you. You really are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you. From His Heart is the viewer-supported broadcast ministry of Dr. Jeff Shreve, who believes that no matter how badly you may have messed up in life, God still loves you and has a wonderful plan for your life. You can find out more about that plan when you go to fromhisheart.org. Real truth, real love.